attending. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending our new ID series. I think this is the first ID series since the shutdown, so we are really excited. And at first, I'd like to thank uh, Lisa Maturo and, and Debra Rees for making this happen. I mean, that's a huge accomplishment. So thank you, Lisa and, and Debra. So we are really excited and honored today to have Dr. Uh, Rule from University of Pennsylvania to give us a talk on using electronic medical records and machine learning algorithms to predict hospital acquired infection. But before I introduce him, let me mention some housekeeping issues. So we will continue extending CME credits for our tech talks and our ID series presentations. Uh, we will distribute the information via email to those that registered for today's event. If you did not register prior to today's talk, you can still obtain CME code information from Lisa Maturo at Christiana Care, and her email address is lisa.m.maturo at christianacare.org. Our next ID series will be June 26th, and that will be Dr. Justin Martello from uh, Christiana Care, who will talk about Parkinson's disease etiology and subtypes. And then we'll have a tech talk, in fact, next week, uh, June 4th, so it's on Thursday, June 4th, and that will be Dr. Gary Henry, who is the Dean of Education and Human Development at University of Delaware. And he will talk about regression discontinuity designs for evaluation, estimating effects from state school reform with validity checks. So that's going to be also super interesting. So again, I'm really excited to uh, welcome Dr. Rule here at our uh, ID series. Dr. Rule is uh, an advanced fellow in health services research at University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, as well as the Philadelphia VA. Uh, where he's working on studies evaluating the efficacy of behavioral economics to improve health behavior in social settings. He has a PhD in social epidemiology from University of Oxford in the UK, and uh, for which uh, he obtained a fellowship from NIH. He has a Master of Sciences in Epidemiology from Harvard School of Public Health, and already has a very long list of peer-reviewed publications. He has had also multiple awards from the Society for Epidemiologic Research and from the American Sociologic Association and from NIH. So we are really, really excited. And uh, thank you so much for being here, Dr. Rulli. Great. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, yeah, and I'm really excited to give the talk in sort of hearing about sort of the, the Innovation Center and the Valley students and what goes on there. I'm excited to have a, a bit of a chat with you all about some of my ongoing research. Uh, into infectious disease prediction. Um, so I'll go ahead, I'll share my screen and get the presentation started. Um, and I guess y'all are still, sort of still figuring out the exact um, the series, but I'm happy to take any questions throughout uh, the talk. So please just stop me if you have anything. Uh, can everybody see the screen? Okay, cool. Uh, so yeah, so... Um, so, so what I'll be talking about today is taking electronic medical record data uh, to look at when patients are in the same hospital ward as other patients and what we can learn using that to predict both hospital-acquired infection as well as potentially asymptomatic infections. Uh, asymptomatic infections particularly becoming a little more uh, relevant in sort of this time of COVID. So just to give a brief outline, uh, I'll start with some background just to get everybody on the same page in terms of healthcare acquired infections and some basic contact tracing. And then I'll go into some depth on two studies I've worked on. The first one, predicting hospital acquired infection using electronic medical records and hospital administrative data. And then the second study, trying to identify asymptomatic infections and their effects on infectious disease dynamic outbreak spread. Uh, using machine learning within, within healthcare systems. And then ending with a couple conclusions and hopefully some Q&A. Uh, so, by healthcare acquired or nosocomial infections, what I mean is an infection acquired in the hospital as opposed to something that you get in the community. So this is somebody either coming into contact with another patient or having potentially some carrier of an infectious agent 
come into contact with another infected agent and uh, share that infection to you. It has a number of adverse effects, both on the individual patient, so increased length of stay, increased mortality, increased healthcare costs, but then also adverse effects on other patients as these infections can spread and lead to secondary tertiary infections and outbreak. And part of this really hammers on this idea that patients aren't alone in the hospital. We often think of patients um, and have their treatment as being pretty independent and really just being dependent on their doctor and how they're responding to the infection or whatever morbidity they're in the hospital for, or the drug, et cetera. Um, but patients are really going on this trajectory through the hospital as they're going from waiting room to ward to bed, et cetera. And particularly for the wards, they're not always individual rooms with single people. They can be larger rooms where patients can see one another, can talk with one another, interact with one another, um, particularly in the National Health Service in the UK, which is where most of the data I'll be talking about is from. That said, I think this is becoming less of the case now with, with COVID and being more aware of trying to keep patients separate. But in general, this is still something that can happen on patients coming into contact. And so patients' health can be impacted by not only themselves, but also the patients that are around in the hospital. So the most intuitively is something like spread of disease, but also things like social influence. So I've done a little bit of work on chemotherapy patients showing that the patients you're around in the chemotherapy ward may actually have measurable effects on, on your survival outcomes. So what this sort of brings to mind then is within the hospital, there's really a network contagion process going on of these infections. So patients can be in the same room as one another uh, within beds and able to spread their infectious agent from patient to patient. It might also be indirect if uh, doctor, nurse, other healthcare worker might come into contact with the patient, get some of the infectious vector on them. And then if there's not 100% effective sanitization, they might then spread it to uh, the next patient they come into contact with. Uh, there's also, you can have reservoirs of inanimate objects. If somehow the, the object itself is not clean, the surface isn't sterilized, the bacterial viral vector can stay there for a little bit. There was a, an outbreak I think about 10 years ago at the NIH Clinical Center of Krebsiella that was eventually traced to a sink not being properly cleaned that ended up infecting I think a couple of 20 patients. So you can have the sort of network process of patients coming into contact with other patients and this can lead to these outbreaks in the healthcare system. We know that this is a network effect, and so we've developed methods to take advantage of this to really prevent and, and limit these effects. The main one of which, of course, I'm sure you're all familiar with is contact tracing, where you take a known case, identify the people they've come into contact with recently, and then depending on what options are available to you, either vaccinate those contacts, quarantine them, subject them to further uh, testing, etc. And so what we can do is we can take these patients and we can go out and we can find all the people that they've come into contact with and hopefully contain the spread that way. There's a couple of disadvantages to this. One, um, it requires having a known case typically. So we don't start contact tracing until we know that a case exists. Which sometimes, especially as we've seen with COVID, you don't know that somebody's a case until after they've been infectious for a period of time. So you're missing a potentially crucial window in being able to identify other infected patients. Uh, it, because of the way contact tracing is done, it requires typically interviews with the patient, finding the people they've come into contact with. Uh, there's a large human element and just a lot of person hours often needs to go into any substantial contact tracing, uh, which as we found hasn't always been sufficient, unfortunately. Uh, and then the third thing is that it typically as we do contact tracing is there's a dichotomization of the amount of time you're around other people. It's sort of none versus any. Of course, I mean, I guess all it takes to get sometimes a sufficient amount of, of bacterial load is somebody coughing in your face once, but there might be uh, more of a range of values of amount of time that you're with infected people that really allows a little more nuance to the amount of time before you're, you're likely infected. Um, so these are some things that I'll be getting into with some of the methods that I'll be showing you. So the main 
um, metric, I guess, that I'll be using in the two studies is this idea of co-presence. So co-presence most generally defined is really just people being in the same place at the same time. In this specific context, it'll be how many hours a patient is spending in the same hospital ward as another patient who's suspected of infection. Um, and I highlight the word suspected there to sort of contrast it to the known case previously, where we can take a patient in the healthcare system a little bit prior to them being positively identified as infected, but as soon as an infection is suspected, it's maybe roll back that um, identification period a little earlier. This has a number of benefits. It allows us to return these results instantly because it's within this electronic medical record system that hospitals typically already have set up, so the implementation is fairly minimal. Uh, it's virtual, so it obviates a lot of this person time of work to do the contact tracing. One interesting thing with this is that there's been a bit of a push recently for digital contact tracing, giving everybody who has a smartphone, like an app, which will then, if you become infected, will then automatically monitor all the other people you come into contact with. But of course, there's a lot of issues with this, both in terms of the ethics of it, of sort of where that data goes, how it's stored, et cetera, but also just the rollout and making sure it's scalable and that people are actually downloading it, installing it, et cetera. So there's a lot of issues with this. Um, and one of the cool things about co-presence in the healthcare setting in this way is it really provides almost a nice laboratory to really test out some of these things in a case where it's almost already set up. And then the final benefit is really that it's disease specific. So some other tests which aren't specific microbiological tests, uh, which use things like C-reactive protein or other biomarkers, which are pretty non-specific measures of inflammation or immune system activity, because this is amount of time spent with other patients who are also, or who are infected, suspected of infected with this specific infection, um, this measure is going to be disease specific. So uh, just to orient you to the two sort of studies and where they're gonna be, here's sort of a stylized picture of human immune response. You sort of get in the introduction of the, the agent here. As you progress with increasing vascular load, you start with your cell mediated immune response, your non-specific response. Only later as your symptomatology and pathology increases, do you get the specific antibody response? So the first study is going to be really identifying some of these overt symptomatic identified cases on this end of the spectrum. Uh, the second study is going to be trying to identify these asymptomatic patients prior to pathology, prior to symptomatology, uh, a little bit earlier using this co-presence and some additional biomarker data. That's pretty much the layout. I'll pause there. Does anybody have any questions? I just jump right into study one. Cool. Okay, so study one is taking this data and we're going to predict hospital or healthcare acquired infection via this metric of co presence. So, really, the, the overarching question here is how well do the total hours a patient is co-present with a patient or patients suspected of infection serve as a predictor of subsequent infection? Uh, the actual methodology to calculate this is pretty straightforward. For each patient, we will look at all the people they're in the same ward with, and we'll just count the number of hours they've been co-present with those patients who have been suspected of infection. Uh, here we're using sort of the time of their first test as our proxy for when they were first suspected of being infected. Once we've counted all that, we'll assign a cut point sort of along the spectrum of number of hours of co-presence. Anything above that much, we'll count them as infected. Anything below that, we'll count them as uninfected. We'll do that for all the possible values of co-presence time, and then we'll calculate the area under the receiver operator characteristic curve uh, based on all of those cut points to see how well this algorithm is performing on average. Um, and then finally, we'll determine our best cut point based on the point closest in Euclidean space to the perfect test. So all that means is uh, it's the point with the sensitivity and specificity, which if you drew a line on the graph to this perfect sensitivity, perfect specificity test, it's the closest point. 
what this sort of implicitly assumes is that the costs of a false negative and a false positive are equal, which isn't always the case. There's situations where you could think of a false positive um, being pretty bad if the cost of the test is very high, for instance. Uh, on the other hand, you can think of a false negative being bad if the effect of an infection is, is really bad and you don't want to miss one. Um, so you can balance these in different ways. Here we've just assumed that we'll just we'll balance them equally. In terms of the patient population, it's all 135,000 patients across two, or inpatients across two teaching hospitals in the UK over a period of five years who were in the hospital for at least 48 consecutive hours. That last bit is important because we do want this algorithm to identify only healthcare acquired infections and not community acquired infections. If we let people who are only in the hospital for like 12 hours, uh, if we tried to predict those, if they became infected in say hour six, it's likely that they were actually infected prior to entering the hospital, but only began to show symptomatology and testing once they entered the hospital. So for that reason, we're gonna look only at the uh, inpatients who were there at least two days. And here's our basic demographic table. So you can see average age about 56, 45% male. Given that you're staying there for at least two days, the, a patient is staying there on average for about 10 day, uh, 12 days. 5% are dying in hospital. And then we're looking at five different infectious conditions here uh, with incidence rates ranging from like 2.5% to 0.02% for norovirus. Given that, um, when we then look at the actual infections, here is a infection network for just one month of the data from one of the hospitals. So it includes a couple hundred patients. Um, and you can see here pretty strong clustering based on infection status. So you can see clusters of infection of these orange nodes. Uh, I guess I should say the nodes, each individual circle is an individual patient and they're connected by an edge or a line if they are in the same ward or co-present for at least one hour. And the way this, the layout algorithm works is it puts nodes together if they're highly connected to each other and to other similar nodes. Um, so you can see here that like there's a nice cluster of infected patients here and here. And what this really highlights is it's sort of a 35,000 foot view, um, infections cluster in networks and specifically these healthcare networks. So what we're going to do with our algorithm uh, is now see how these effects actually work quantitatively. So in terms of the results, we sort of, as I said, we'll, we'll, we ran the different various cutoffs and we see very high area under the curve. So for the five different conditions, this is having an area under the curve of between 0.93 and one. Uh, norovirus is sort of a weird one. There were only 22 cases and the typical standard operating procedure is to send somebody home as soon as they are diagnosed with norovirus. So there wasn't really a whole lot of data there to go. But what there is at least shows some predictive power. All that said, there is, um, these are actually so high that there's actually a little bit of cause for worry. So I'll get into some sensitivity analyses we've done in a slide or two. The next thing we did, and if you'll remember when I was talking about co-presence or contact tracing, we often divide the co-presence is sort of none versus any. But here we were able to look at that threshold across the whole range. And the actual ideal threshold turned out to be over 24 hours for all of them. So contrary to just sort of being around a patient for a minute, having them cough in your face, it's potentially more of a situation where it's the general accretion of some of these particles which are laden with, with bacteria or viral particles. Uh, which need to sort of slowly spread over time before this really becomes a high risk effect. I should note though um, that these don't necessarily need to be accrued in sequence, they can be accrued in parallel. So if you are, for instance, uh, if you're in a ward with 29 other infected C. diff patients, you only need to spend sort of one real hour to accrue your 29 person hours of co-presence time. Um, so just to let you know. Uh, then the last thing is, this is all well and good, but the real clinical utility of this is really only there if this algorithm allows us to detect infection earlier than it otherwise would have happened. So to that end, we looked at the difference in time between when 
uh, a patient first crossed whatever the threshold was, and then the time at which they actually received their microbiological test in the hospital data. Um, and so you can see for like something like C. diff, it was only something like six hours, which probably that's not a, a hugely clinically meaningful amount of time. Whereas something like Pseudomonas being detected 22 hours earlier really, excuse me, um, might allow for earlier quarantine, earlier testing, reducing some of those negative effects I talked about earlier. Those are sort of the main results. And I want to come back to this idea of the areas under the curve being sort of 0 0.93, 1, et cetera. Typically, we think of area under the curves as being like really, really good if it's like 0 0.8. Something like 0 0.95 is often worried that there's something that it's, it's either unfairly managed in some way or if there's something going on that's not understood. So what we did is we tried two different sensitivity analyses to see if we were missing something. The first one is we used a negative control. So this is the idea that it could be the case that all the immunocompromised patients are put into a ward together, and then if some infectious vector was introduced to this population, they would all become infected. And via the algorithm, it would look like they were sort of spreading it from one to another, whereas in reality, it was, they were all just latently very similar patients, all very likely to be infected. Um, so what we do here is we use something that will also occur in healthcare settings, so sepsis, but it shouldn't transfer from patient to patient in sort of a, a contagious way like this. So if we rerun the same analysis on sepsis, if the model is picking up on true sort of network contagion, the area under the curve for sepsis should be much lower than 0.99 or 0.9 or really anything above like 0.7. Uh, the second thing we did is we removed patients who were not at risk. So if you remember on the slide where the incidence was about 2.5% for some of the infections, that gives you a pretty wide imbalance between your infected group and your uninfected group, which just by virtue of that imbalance, you can have a, an artificially inflated area under the curve. So you can just sort of say nobody's infected and you would be right 97.5% of the time. Um, so we wanted to balance this by dropping patients who really weren't at risk. So anytime a patient was in the hospital without any other infected patients, um, so there was no sort of outbreak going on, we dropped them from the sample. And this removed about two-thirds of the patients, two-thirds to three-quarters, depending on the infection in question. Um, and so once we did that, hopefully we would see sort of similarly high areas under the curve and not that they'd be were being strongly advantaged by just having a lot of these almost like freebie uh, classifications. So when we run our, our negative control on sepsis, we indeed see that the area under the curve is much lower. It's about 0.54, sort of lending some evidence to the idea that the infection specifically, this algorithm is picking up on something specific to the networked contagion I was talking about. Um, when we remove those who aren't at risk, we still see very high areas under the curve, lower than what we observed uh, in that table I showed, but still on the order of 0 0.88, 0 0.9. So in terms of conclusions from the first study, one is really that co-presence seems to be a very strong predictor of healthcare acquired infection, and that using it in this manner may also allow us to detect infections earlier than with current standard operating procedure. Um, and as I alluded to earlier, it really might serve as an ideal setting to pilot some of this virtual contact tracing. It removes some of these hurdles of, of rollout, of people actually downloading the app, uh, some of the ethical issues, the data are already stored at the hospital and work as, as PHI. Um, so this might be a really nice setting in which to test it initially. So that's it for study one. I'll pause there and see if anybody has any questions before moving to study two. Great, okay. So study two then is taking this the next step forward. So study one was pretty straightforward. We just took the amount of co-presence time um, and then used it to predict infection. What we now want to do is identify asymptomatic infections using not only those co-presence time 
uh, hours, but then also bringing in more information from the electronic medical record of that sort of non-specific immune response. So some biomarkers like C-reactive protein, eosinophil counts, um, et cetera, which might allow us to identify these asymptomatic patients and then secondary to identifying them, once we've identified them, try and examine whether they're having an effect on disease outbreak dynamics within the healthcare system. Uh, so the methods here to identify these patients, we're initially going to assume all the patients who have a positive test or medical record diagnosis are infected and everybody else is uninfected. So that two and a half percent of infected patients we're starting off as infected, everybody else uninfected. We'll then use a bunch of data from the electronic medical record, uh, the hospital administrative data, et cetera, chuck it into a random forest, which I'll describe uh, more in depth in a minute, and then see which patients are classified as infected. Importantly, some individuals will move from the uninfected category to the infected category. Um, and that's because they're, even though they don't have a positive microbiological test, they have co-presence time, they have an immune system response that all looks like they're infected. So these are the patients that we're going to sort of call asymptomatic, that these are the patients who look like an infected patient, even though they don't have a positive test. And the reason for that is probably because they were asymptomatic, um, they weren't tested because nobody suspected them of having an infection. Jumping back to the random forest, this is a supervised machine learning algorithm uh, supervised in that the algorithm is sort of told from the outset what the correct classification is. So we tell it from the outset who's infected, who's uninfected. It then takes a random subset of the variables or the features in the model, and it will go through those and find the cut points of those variables that best separate observations. So it might first take a subset of the variables and find out that those over 65 are more likely to be infected than under 65. And of those who are over 65, males are more likely to be infected than females, et cetera. And it'll go through that and it'll do that a couple times. Each one of those is a random tree where it will create these classifications. It will then repeat these trees many times with many different sets of variables. And this ensemble of trees is what's gonna be called a random forest. Then if you take an observation, you filter it through all of these individual trees. Each tree will give you an answer. So here it's sort of class A, class B, class B. And then you aggregate the results of all the different trees in the forest. The simplest way is to just sort of say what's the majority, but there's more complicated ways as well. Um, but majority voting is what we do here. Uh, and then you arrive at sort of a final class estimation for each observation. So we then take that, all that data and we're going to use the same patient population here, so same 135,000 patients. Um, the only difference is we're only going to be looking here at C. diff rather than all five of the conditions, mostly just for simplicity of presenting the results. Once we ran the algorithm, the main sort of first pass result is that co-presence is the strongest single classifier. Uh, so you can see that there's pretty strong separation between the infected class over here and the uninfected class here and the asymptomatic class, as we sort of expect, because these are the people who are being lumped in with the infecteds, uh, are matching pretty nicely on top of the infected. Notice, though, that there are some uninfected patients who are clustering, who have high co-presence times. Um, but even though they have these high co-presence times, they're not showing these immune responses, the eosinophils, the neutrophils, uh, the C-reactive protein, those aren't also elevated in these patients. Uh, so it's able to successfully remove them from the, the asymptomatic group or prevent them from entering the asymptomatic group. So we run this, we now have our set of asymptomatic individuals. And so here is the same network I showed from earlier, only now I've included the asymptomatic cases. So these are the, the larger purple circles. There's eight of them in this figure. Uh, you can sort of see their spread throughout. One interesting one, which we'll come back to in a little bit, is this one, which seems to maybe be bridging this large uh, cluster here and this cluster down here, and maybe acting as almost like a bridge between these different clusters of infected patients. Uh, before we get to some of the 
outbreak dynamics, one thing we didn't have here is sort of the gold standard. So unlike with the previous study where we knew which patients were infected and which weren't, we don't know here which ones are asymptomatically infected. Um, because these patients weren't tested, we can't, and it's all retrospective data, we can't go back and actually check to see if they were actually infected. So we do sort of the next best thing. We take the patients we know are infected, and so we initially randomly classify 10 of them as uninfected. We sort of try and trick the model and say, these infected patients aren't really infected, they're uninfected. Now rerun, and how well do you identify those 10%? And the answer there is, is pretty well. It, on average, identifies 95% of them. So of those 10%, 95% of that are being re, are correctly reclassified as infected. Um, and this really puts a nice upper bound on the accuracy of this algorithm. We sort of, we assume that infected patients look more like other infected patients than asymptomatic patients would look like infected patients. So if that's the case, then this is sort of the best the model could do with accurately pulling over these infected patients. Um, the nice thing is, is that this in this setting, it never really pulls over um, patients who we don't know if they're infected. Uh, so there's likely only false negatives, not hopefully not false positives. Oh, again, can't rule that out. Um, another thing we wanted to do, both in terms of understanding how asymptomatic infections work, but then also a bit, as again, a bit of a validation, was to look at how these asymptomatic infections may affect patient outcomes. Um, so if we have a patient, their immune system is activated, they're in the hospital, these asymptomatic infections probably are having some effect, but probably we hypothesize not as bad an effect as people who are progressing all the way to over symptomatic infection. So what we're assuming here is that if we put, it, we, we build a couple models for two healthcare outcomes, both stay length and mortality. Um, we first include just a two category variable, so one with just uninfected and infected, and then we add in our third category of asymptomatic infections. And the, the hypothesis is that the model will fit better in that latter case because now having the information on un or asymptomatic patients, uh, the model will better be able to identify their outcomes in the setting. Um, so what we see here is that when we look at our stay line from death, the BIC, which is a measure of model fit, improves for both models when we include the asymptomatic patients. Um, when we look at stay length, we see that on average, these asymptomatic patients are staying 170 hours more than an uninfected patient, but the infected patients are staying 700 hours on average more than the uninfected patients. So this is what I mean, that the, these asymptomatic infections are having sort of an intermediate effect between these uninfected patients and the infected patients. Uh, for hospital mortality, we do observe that both asymptomatics and infecteds have significantly increased mortality rates, um, but they're not significantly different from one another, largely because of small sample sizes. Not many people are infected and not many people die. So the sort of two unlikely probabilities doesn't really happen very much. There's not a lot of power to detect differences. Um, so this, again, was a nice both bit of a check on seeing whether these asymptomatic infections are behaving as we expect them to, but then also seeing what their effect on these patient outcomes is. The last thing we wanted to check, and sort of something that's come up a lot now with COVID-19 and the thought of asymptomatic spread, is really how are these infections affecting outbreak spread? So coming back to this note here, you can very easily come up with like a, a just-so story of they started in a ward with all these patients down here, became asymptomatically infected, were transferred to this ward, unknowingly infectious, and then started one or more of these different clusters over here. Uh, we can actually test that um, quantitatively by looking at the actual structure of the network here. So this group of three nodes here on the left, you have an asymptomatic patient connecting or bridging the connection between two other otherwise unconnected infected patients. So if that scenario I just described is happening, 
we would actually expect to see this structure in the network more often than if the network were just randomly permuted. Um, because this would sort of be indicating that this infected patient might have infected this symptomatic, who then infected this infected patient. And that is what we see. We observe this more than expected. Uh, conversely, if we look at this structure, where these two are now uninfected patients, we'd expect to see this less often than expected by chance if these asymptomatics are truly infectious, because you'd then expect one or both of these to zero convert uh, to infected. And again, we do see that as we hypothesize. We observe this less than expected by chance. Um, but both of these are sort of in the, the aggregate network. We collapse over all of them. Is there a question? Um, so we then take these structures and we then want them to look at the sort of temporal effect. So here it's, it's all aggregated over time. Uh, we just lump everybody into a single network, one sort of big snapshot. Uh, what we want to do then is see what is the effect on the temporal dynamics of the outbreak. Uh, so we then move to look at the effect on the, these dynamics. And so what we did here is we initially, we took our data, we looked at all the individual outbreaks over the five years. So an outbreak was sort of each individual uh, seed case or primary affected case and then the cases that they infected. So for C. diff, I think they're on the order of 40 or 50 different outbreaks over this course of five years. What we then do is we look at the data, both including the, the asymptomatic patients and excluding the asymptomatic patients. And so what was the, the outbreak size? How big were the outbreaks? What was the range, et cetera? Um, so if we look at the asymptomatic, when we include the asymptomatics, we see that the median outbreak size was four, the mean outbreak size was about seven and a half. When we exclude those asymptomatics, uh, the median stays the same, but the mean outbreak size dropped by about one and a half. So on average, each of these outbreaks, the model was detecting about one and a half asymptomatic infections. What we then did is using literature values, we and the actual observed network data, but not the infection data. We simulated a lot of these outbreaks on the network. Uh, where we used an SETIR model, which has sort of an asymptomatic box. And we found that on average, the sort of the median, the mean size of the outbreaks were pretty similar to what we actually observed in the network. The biggest difference is the maximum uh, outbreak size was much bigger in these simulated ones, which is probably because in sort of talking to healthcare practitioners, that once an outbreak is to a certain size in the hospital, there's very strong uh, quarantine protocols, et cetera that limits the, the upper bound of that. So you don't you see them topping out at 30 rather than 84. Then the question was, so we've now got a model that we think pretty well captures how these infections are working. What happens if we're able to identify these asymptomatic cases and quarantine them? Does this limit the asymptomatic uh, cases and does it limit secondary spread from the asymptomatic cases? And we generally find it does. So when we put quarantine in, sort of patients who are asymptomatically infected and identified as such no longer are as infectious. We see the median outbreak size decreasing, and we see the mean outbreak size decreasing even below what we observed without including the asymptomatics. So indicating that not only would we prevent some of these asymptomatic infections, we would also prevent downstream secondary tertiary infections reducing the size of the outbreak. So in terms of conclusions from this study, one, we think the algorithm is identifying likely asymptomatic cases, um, which is something that is very useful both for healthcare uh, settings, but then also particularly with COVID as we think about uh, asymptomatic infections, both in the community and in healthcare settings, of identifying those cases as well without necessarily constant testing. Uh, we do see that these asymptomatic infections adversely affect individual patient outcomes, but then also these outbreak dynamics, that they are potentially the cause of a number of infections each time there's an outbreak. Um, but so hopefully identifying and quarantining these asymptomatic cases may lead to reduced outbreak size. Uh, 
Um, then bringing it back, sort of combining studies one and two, the, again, co-presence in both study one, and even though it wasn't the only thing in study two, it was still the strongest predictor, this co-presence from hospital administrative data really is a strong tool to understand infection in the hospital and how this infection is, is spreading from patient to patient. As these digital tools develop, as we want to try and identify infections, identify asymptomatic infections, this can extend beyond the healthcare system. But as I've said, the healthcare system, I think, really is an ideal place to start looking at it. Um, with moving it to, to beyond the healthcare system, there are a lot of these important ethical considerations, which aren't as big an issue within the healthcare setting because a lot of this is already um, set up. Uh, I think the third thing is that then this really should be tested prospectively to really, one, I think, make sure that we didn't miss anything. Um, so we, we talk to healthcare practitioners, particularly with the, because it's all retrospective data, to try and find if there was something we were missing that was potentially idiosyncratic to the healthcare system that wasn't being captured in the model. We tried to address all that, but nothing quite uh, works as well as, as on the ground, boots on the ground experience really trying it out uh, to really see how it works prospectively. So that's sort of the next steps. Unfortunately, I, in talking with some people at, at Penn, at the VA, it probably doesn't work to do COVID-specific work. I don't know what it's like, uh, Christiana, um, but it sounds like COVID at least, because we're all very aware of the, the asymptomatic issue, there's pretty strong controls in place to prevent this type of spread from happening. So I don't think, which is a good thing, very good thing for patients, um, but not so great from a research perspective uh, and sort of seeing how some of this may be working as COVID progresses. Um, I just want to thank all of my collaborators, uh, particularly John Finney at the University of Oxfordshire Hospitals for helping us get the data, uh, my advisors, my collaborators, et cetera. And I want to thank you all uh, for your time. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ruley. Any question for, uh, for Dr. Ruley? Hi, this is Carolyn Zoldis. Um, I know that this is probably getting into the weeds, but what sort of data points were you pulling besides hours? How, was it how many occurrences of a, of a negative versus a positive lab were you pulling from the medical record? Um, so no, it wasn't. We actually just were looking at, at the first positive ones. That was okay. at least for the testing. That's really all we cared about. Um, in terms okay. of the actual like model that we built, it was uh, like eosinophils, neutrophils, uh, C-reactive protein, a number of demographics, uh, okay. what their morbidities, those kinds of right. things. Right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, this is uh, Jihad from MUSC. Um, did you look aside for co-presence? Um, I know you looked at the time dimension, but did you also look at like, the different types of uh, wards um, and like size of the ward and things like that? We did. I didn't. I didn't. I should include it as an extra slide. One thing we did was we actually did a ward by ward analysis. So if we sort of just limited our analysis to a single ward, uh, what actually brought this on is we found out there was a quarantine ward um, in the hospital, and so we were initially worried that that was inflating the results. We ended up dropping it from the main analysis because it was very strongly affecting the results. Um, but once we dropped it, even then we looked at all the individual wards. And the areas under the curve, if you look at any given ward, range from, I think, like 0.7 to 0.9. So there were a couple uh, wards where it didn't work as well, but on average, it still worked quite well. Thank you. Hi, this is Nina. Can you hear me? Oh, go sorry, ahead, Claudine. Go ahead. No, no, no I have, a, I have a couple of questions. I have a couple of questions. You can go ahead. Okay. Well, I have one question, but it might be long. I, I'm not quite sure I understood the, the quarantine issue because you were looking at retrospective data. So how did you figure out which patients were in quarantine? I mean, I, I, or, or, you know, because they were, um, they were asymptomatic, How, how, how did they get into quarantine? I mean, I, that's what I'm, I'm confused. I'm yeah, sorry. So, yeah, sorry. So these two columns here are simulations. So we sort of, we took uh, literature values, we took the network, and that's where our, the, the, um, that's how much of our 
actual data we used, but then the actual outbreaks we simulated for this column. And then for this column with the quarantine, we then said, okay, what if now once a patient's identified as asymptomatic, we sort of treat them as being quarantined in the simulated setting, what then looks like. So yeah, in no way were any of these patients actually quarantined. It was just sort of saying like, what would have happened um, if they had been potentially. And also, if I may ask, since you are on this slide, how do you measure the size of the outbreak? What, what does it mean exactly, size of outbreak? Yep, so what we did is we found each, we found sort of a, a primary case, and then the outbreak was once after that initial case, you had gone two days without any positive cases of that disease in the hospital. Um, so two days seem to be about the, the um, incubation period for C. diff. So we sort of gave it two days. I think we also, we toyed around with a couple of different timings of that, but I think we settled on two days. So, so the, the unit is the number of days for the size of the outbreak? Or sorry, uh, no, the, the unit is the number of cases that occur prior to there being a two-day stretch without any cases. I see. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, no uh, great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, we are working on a similar project, but it's between healthcare providers and it's about COVID. So the question that I have, maybe I missed it, but was the network weighted or was it just unweighted based on the presence or absence of patients in the same ward? Uh, the network, so the the actual algorithm to detect the asymptomatic infections, it very much used, yeah, the whole range, it was weighted on number of hours. The network image I showed was just, just for ease of presentation, I just dichotomized it at no co-presence versus any. Okay, I see. And did you look at different communities of patients and maybe there's a difference, like did you use any community detection algorithm? We, had, we did not actually do any community detection on the network. Um, I think the, the, the ward-specific analysis is mainly what that, I think, would have boiled down to. It actually would be interesting to do, I guess, a community detection and see how well that maps on to the individual wards. Um, that could be a useful analysis, but no, we didn't do that. Okay. And just curious, was it implemented? Was there an opportunity to implement this work in the hospital setting? Um, not during my dissertation period. I have submitted a grant to the VA to try and do this prospectively once I think COVID is, is passed. Everything's sort of very much in flux at the moment. But yeah, not, so not at the moment, but hopefully. Right. Any other questions? Yes. yes. Uh, this is David Chen, um, also working on the same project, trying to look at things between COVID um, potentially, and healthcare workers versus patients. Um, one question that I had was, if you're aware of methods looking at network devolution or de-evolution, where um, examining disruption to networks um, and whether uh, that is a something that you could determine from the data that you have. Um, so I, I guess I'm very, I don't generally work a lot with it. I'm like very vaguely familiar. So is your question? Um, whether sort of the network devolution is happening in the networks or whether you can identify like nodes or groups that you could quarantine to prevent some of this infectious disease spread. So both, one, if network devolution is occurring, because I imagine once patients are identified as positive, then they are quarantined um, or at least separated. As an example, like we have um, patients that share rooms um, and then as soon as someone is identified as positive, they are cohorted with other patients that are positive and removed from patients who are negative. Um, and so there's some kind of effect there, though it's not as strong as say transitioning them to an entire ward um, of similarly cohorted patients. And so just wanted to see one, how you accounted for that kind of process within the analysis, as well as whether um, actual implementation of more war specific quarantine um, would have an impact because it seemed like you had kind of hinted at that with doing the SCTIR analysis with quarantine as you show here. Yeah, so in terms of the first point, I guess we, we didn't explicitly account for the devolution. We just sort of 
removed any time patients spent in the quarantine ward um, from the analysis. So it's sort of as soon as they were moved, we dropped any further time until they were moved back out of the quarantine ward. Um, we didn't actually check, sort of compare, I guess, the two networks with the quarantine ward versus without the quarantine ward to see how that might have affected really the structure of the network. Um, but I think the standard operating procedure of the hospital was such that it, they should, it shouldn't have been any uh, spread after they left that quarantine ward, although we could actually go back and check. Um, so we didn't do that. In terms of the quarantining entire wards, that we also didn't do. I think that would be a really useful analysis, not just necessarily quarantining individual patients, but potentially quarantining like a ward or at least a room or a wing, not a wing, um, potentially a room if an asymptomatic patient were to be observed or be, be potentially detected in that room. Yeah, I think that would work. Thanks. And just a quick kind of uh, attached question is, you had mentioned that um, you didn't feel that this similar analysis would be as applicable with COVID. And I, I, was, uh, I was curious as to why you felt that way. Um, I noticed that the, the infections that you were talking about were primarily non-respiratory transmission. Um, we think it seems like mostly contact um, related transmission as compared to droplets um, or aerosolization. And so, Curious, one, as to why you thought it would be more difficult to model this with COVID, and then two, whether um, respiratory transmission changes the, the network dynamics and how you would structure it um, or not. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So we had we had devised this study a couple of years ago. So it was before COVID had happened. I, we don't have like super up-to-date data um, with COVID from the hospitals. So I think this study was more just sort of generally what we learned about asymptomatic infections. Uh, we didn't include any respiratory infections, mostly because in talking with physicians at the time, uh, these were the ones that they mentioned as probably the, the most important ones where this might be happening. Um, all that said, and then the initial plan I had in terms of some of these grant applications was to do this on COVID, but in talking with people both at Penn and the VA, it sounds like their standard operating procedures are really pretty on top of do consistent testing, um, quarantining asymptomatic, in fact, or quarantining any positive tested people uh, for COVID. So there really wouldn't be a whole lot of, hopefully, um, patients being in wards with COVID infected patients. It might be something to go back and actually like check some of the data, but for the time, I think the, the consensus I got was that, that probably wasn't worth checking out. Hi, this is uh, Chris Pennington. With respect to that, I'm wondering if um, nursing homes or long-term care facilities um, where this would be applicable for COVID-19, which would, it's not community, it's not hospital ward with quarantine, um, just a thought. Yeah, no, that would be really good. I know the, the VA actually has a couple, um, I want to think, C-Box, it's community-based, no. They have both, they've got a couple of these smaller ones as well as, if not nursing homes, at least some care facilities, uh, which might actually have data on that. So that, I should go in and check that out. I don't, I don't have any connections with any sort of nursing homes, care facilities outside of that, but that is, I think, worth checking. Right, any other question? I could ask questions all day, um, <laughs> <laughs> just as a, a quick other one. So again, the, the conception that we're pursuing is looking at connections between um, healthcare workers using the patients as the edges and with the healthcare workers as the nodes, um, kind of more targeted at this concept of unfortunately asymptomatic transmitters potentially being um, healthcare workers or patients prior to isolation and cohorting. Um, and I can say, like, anecdotally, we have noticed that um, at least uh, for healthcare worker associated transmission, what early described literature there is, that that's a, that's a major concern. And as to the point you raised earlier, um, with the nursing facilities, nursing home facilities as well, um, what was the thought in terms of 
choosing like uh, essentially co-location and exposure as compared to um, like, you know, that time of exposure as compared to um, things abstracted outside of physical location and more by that interpersonal relationship? Mainly it was, I think that was the, the data we were able to get access to. Um, we did try to get more information on sort of both health nurses and physicians on when they were seeing patients. Uh, but I think there was a lot of pushback on actually getting that data from the healthcare system. Um, because I think it really would have been interesting if we could have teased out potentially some of this, what infection is happening between, with the healthcare worker potentially in, carrying it between two patients versus what's occurring because two patients are coming into contact with each other. Being able to tease that out would have been awesome, um, but we did not have that data. Thank you. David, you still have uh, time for another question, if you wish. Yeah. Yeah, can we get in touch with you to ask you a bunch more questions later? Yes, uh, yeah, <laughs> let me go back to my contact info. Yeah, I'm happy to chat about uh, this at, at any point. Chat. All right, well, if there is no more question, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. And, uh, you know, I, I'm sure that there will be opportunities for collaboration. Thank you again. Thank Bye. you.